Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Energy in America, here we are on a given Wednesday right after Christmas, and we have Lou Pugliarisi, EPRINC, uh, a think tank in Washington over energy on, on, the, on, the, on the hookup here. And we're going to sort of uh, get, get back to business here again today on a Wednesday. And he was here last week, so I got to see him again. It's wonderful now. You know, it's not the same thing to see him on, on, on um, Zoom, but we like him anyway. Welcome back to your show, Lou. Okay, I'm happy to be here, Jay. <laughs> so today, uh, today we're going to talk about what happened to oil prices, which is a really good question these days. And of course, inherent in that is what, is, what do oil prices mean to us these days, uh, globally and here in Hawaii? So what do you think? So I think that, you know, it's quite interesting because if you were around in the early part of 2018, oil prices were rising. All the investment houses were talking about $100 oil. Uh, the U.S., there was a big uh, uh, expanded production, some improvements in Libya. The Saudis increased production, and OPEC more or less lost control of the market, or uh, the Saudis probably encouraged that, given their relationship with Trump. In any case, uh, we have seen a, a rather substantial decline in oil prices. I'm going to talk about what that means not only for uh, the world and the U.S., but more importantly for Hawaii. Ah, good. So I thought, so I thought we'd start out first with some quick facts on Hawaii, which is our first uh, kind of slide up here. And you can see here, and I think it's very important because there's a lot of discussion about renewable power, but still you're going to see that oil, oil prices and the very important products produced from them gasoline and low sulfur uh, fuel oil or diesel fuel uh, mean a great deal to the state of Hawaii. But anyway, Hawaii is the first step, state, uh, by the way, to set a deadline for generating 100 percent of its electricity from renewable sources. Mm -hmm. uh, it is actually the lowest uh, uh, residential energy consumer because of your very moderate climate. Mm -hmm. uh, solar provided half of Hawaii's uh, renewable generation in 2017. That's half of your, you are still largely generating your power. I think almost 80 to 85 percent from uh, fuel oil and coal. Uh, but Hawaii is one of the seven states with uh, utility scale generation from geothermal. And, uh, but anyway. Uh, well, but you remember the geothermal is offline right now. Because of yes, the, uh, I understand. You know, the eruption a few months but, ago. And you do have the highest retail power prices in the country, but you don't use a lot of us. So, uh, uh -huh. so let's go to the, uh, the next slide here. And so you can see the rather remarkable uh, change in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, prices of uh, crude oil. And the, the three benchmark prices are shown there. You can see Brent, which is the North, uh, North Atlantic priced out in, off the United Kingdom, more or less. Uh, WTI, which is Western Texas Intermediate. Basically, crude oil has priced in Texas. And the uh, OPEC basket. And these vary by uh, several dollars, largely due to quality differentials and logistics and transportation. Where does LSO... Where does LSO fit on this chart? So, so basically, LSO is, you'll find out, and I'm going to show you in the next chart, that both the low sulfur uh, fuel oil and diesel really track very closely, and we have some data on that, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, gasoline. Both of these uh, fuels, however, are more dependent on what we call the feedstock, crude oil, than any other feature. In fact, that might be a time to go to the next picture. Okay. And so this next picture shows what do we pay for a gallon of retail regular gasoline, right? How do we, you know, contribute uh, cost component? And what are the contributing cost components to on-highway diesel fuel? Now, when you burn diesel fuel or low-sulfur fuel oil, in your uh, power plants in Hawaii, you don't pay taxes on that fuel unless they're 
generated. You don't pay federal taxes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the state of Hawaii collects some taxes. I don't know. But I think it's important to understand that, yes, over time, you can see if you look at the blue boxes, right, the contribution of the main feedstock has declined. And the reason for that are twofold. In the case of gasoline, uh, taxes are taking a bigger piece, you see. So if you look from 2018 to 2017, the average federal and state tax was about 15% for gasoline. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, in 2017, 19%. Right? Mm -hmm. 2018, you know, prices have come down. This is the data from 2017. And also for diesel fuel, federal and state taxes, which are a bit higher for diesel fuel, and the interesting thing, when you look at this distribution in marketing and refining costs, that, has, that percentage of that has risen. Most of that has to do with uh, fuel standards like ethanol and new specifications, which have risen the cost uh -huh. for those fuels. So. But once again, the main component continues to be uh, the feedstock, which is crude, which is crude oil. Now, this is what kind of important for Hawaii if we go to the next chart, right? So if you look at Hawaii, Hawaiian uh, energy consumption by end use sector, right? If you're a Hawaiian consumer, you, you generally buy fossil fuel energy in two pieces. When you fill up your car, or in your case, your large yacht, Jay, and when you fill it up with diesel fuel, you know, the, thank you for that. <laughs> that you know, about half of the uh, you know energy consumption in Hawaii is in the transportation sector. Yes, and I think it's very important. So gasoline is important. It's very important the price of gasoline for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But a good uh, a good uh, the remaining part of energy consumption is in the residential, commercial, industrial sectors. And that is largely, not entirely, but largely electricity and power consumption. They, they say so, that, uh, we, that we send $6 billion out of state every year to pay for fossil fuel. That's what they be, they've been saying. So when you t tally it all up between cars and yeah, it, generation of power, that's what you get. And it's not so bad. You figure the GNP, the state gross domestic product, is about seventy-seven billion, I think. So, yeah. it's, and the state's yeah. budget is something it's, between, I think, eleven or twelve or something like that. That's the governmental yeah. budget. You see how much how much money is involved in, in uh, fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. Now the interesting thing is, if you go around the United States, if you go look at the next state, I mean, taxes are a big piece of the gasoline bill. And I think the interesting thing here, take a look at state gasoline, the next chart, which shows a state gasoline tax as a percent, as of uh, February 2017 in cents per gallon. And, you know, things are pretty expensive in Hawaii. But the interesting thing I found about this chart is the state of Hawaii does not have r relatively high taxes on gasoline. Mm -hmm. In fact, you are one of the lower ones. I mean, compared to Pennsylvania or the state of Washington, even, uh, and of course, uh, uh, California is up there. So the state of Hawaii has pretty, you know, it, its gasoline tax is, is pretty low. Mm -hmm. And that may reflect the fact that a lot of people in Hawaii must travel a considerable distance these days as a real estate cost to, to their job. Mm hmm and it's politically an important issue, I presume, for the state, right? Oh, yes, it is, for sure. All right. Then we look, so then I want to look a little bit more at net, Hawaii net electricity generation by source through September 2018. And this data is from um, the Energy Information Agency of the U.S. Department of Energy. So it's very credible data. And, you know, we, we've talked on many times I can't believe how many times we've talked about renewable power and how it works and what it means and how important it is. But the bottom line is, right, you are getting over 600,000 megawatt hours from petroleum-fired power, right? You're getting over 100 from coal-fired and then about 100 from non-hydroelectric renewables. Uh -huh. So... We got a long way to go yet. to replace uh, replace petroleum yeah. with renewables. 
So you're not at 100 percent yet. So I, I think it's important to keep this in perspective. So what happens to fuel prices is really important in the power sector. Mm -hmm. In the transportation sector, we've sort of shown that, but also in the power sector. You're not free of this burden, so to speak. And uh, another state which has experimented extensively with renewables is the state of California. And I want to show you some data from there on the next chart. Um, if you look at electricity prices in California and compare them to the rest of the United States, and California does have access to low-cost power, but they have chosen not to use it. Uh, they have access to lots of natural gas. They could import that. They can import uh, power from other states. They can generate their own. But it's very important to see that uh, sometimes a renewal, just because something is inexhaustible, doesn't mean it's inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And you can see in California that electricity prices since 2011 have risen about five times faster than the rest of the United States. Why? And this, is lar this is largely driven to its very expensive and ex an extensive commitment to renewable power. Renewable power uh, looks good on paper, but as I will show you in the, in the second half of the program, it does come with some costs for which the proponents uh, don't always reveal what those costs are early on in the process. Well, let, me, let me ask you, when you say there are special yeah. costs for renewables, are you including the cost of building the infrastructure for renewables? Because that'll have a useful life, you know, of longer than, say, one year. Um, yeah, so, so, we have, yeah. so we can look at levelized costs. So I want to show you a chart with levelized costs, which is the right. You're absolutely correct. That's the way to do that. And we also want to look at um, the cost of addressing uh, intermittency. Mm -hmm, yeah. So when we look at those two costs, so, yeah, it's possible you could argue that uh, with uh, built into the California higher cost numbers are, quote, um, investments, which are not paying off yet. Right. But largely, the way a power is uh, funded is is with a long-term uh, levelized cost estimate to consumers. So I don't think you're going to get a big bump in productivity improvements in California. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit about uncertainty on prices. You know, it, it, I actually do think a renewable uh, port, uh, a portfolio of power, which includes a lot of renewables, depending on your endowment, makes sense from price diversification. I think it's an entirely foolish idea to go to 100 percent renewable. Well, if let's, let's go to California. The... California is, um, yeah. you know, interested in renewables. It's got this chart showing that it's paying more than the rest of the country, which is, I guess, more less on renewables, more on fossil fuel going forward. Um, what can Hawaii learn from the, the chart you showed us about the comparison of California prices and national prices? I think the thing they can learn, and we're going to talk about that a bit in the, in the uh, second half of the show, but I think the fundamental thing they can learn is you should have great caution when you look at numbers with point estimates and have some understanding of the variability around those estimates that are out there because you're dealing with new technologies often. You're dealing in which people, engineers, and people of even goodwill do not have a lot of experience in really in understanding what the true costs are or how they'll actually perform. We have this problem in nuclear power, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Nuclear yeah. power looks terrific. But we, we cannot contain its costs often. And uh, you could argue that's a regulatory issue. You can argue it's an engineering issue. There's lots of, you know, bad management. You can go on and on. But, in fact, this stuff sort of happens. Well, I can, I can hardly wait for the, the second half of the show, <laughs> Lou. This makes me want to take a break all the more quickly. So let's take a break now. <laughs> that's Lou Pugliarisi, okay. Eat Brink. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back, and we're going to find out what all this means to Hawaii. We'll be right back. Aloha. I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of 
Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger, and hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. We're going to find out from Lou Pugliarisi what it really means, we're going to, and we're going to focus on exactly what this says about our 2045 100% renewables goal. Okay, ready, Lou? Yeah. Okay, so let's let, let's take a look at what the cost of a levelized cost of new generating technologies in 2018 using what we call 2011 2011 dollars per megawatt hour. Just a way to adjust for inflation. Okay. So let's put this next chart up. This chart is an interesting chart because it's done by the Institute for Energy Research, and we know them; they're very good. But it's really driven off a of very extensive data from the U.S. Department of Energy. The, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things I was surprised by this. Uh, but anyway, what, they, what we're trying to do, what they're trying to do with this chart is look at uh, two kinds of technologies. Uh, dispatchable technologies, let me see if I can get this up here, and, uh, and non-dispatchable technologies. Mm -hmm. And you can see here that um, when you try to look at, you're going to try to look at all four aspects of investment, transmission investment, burial, variable uh, overhead and, and, you know, maintenance costs, uh, levelized capital costs, and fixed uh, um, operations and, and maintenance, you know. So, and then you look at non-dispatchable technologies, and you ask yourself, okay, what, you know, what, uh, how do these compare based on the data we know today? I'm not saying some of these technologies can't get more efficient over time. And I think it's very interesting to look at the comparison of the dispatchable technologies and the non-dispatchable technologies. Most renewable fuel is non-dispatchable, right? Right. It is non-dispatchable because it is, it's intermittent. And it's uh, unpredictable. You know, it's, I think solar is not really unpredictable. It, it's pretty predictable when the sun goes down mm -hmm. in Hawaii. But I think what's interesting about this is you can take a look at, for example, conventional coal, advanced coal. And I think the main competitor here on the mainland with renewables is conventional combined cycle and advanced combined cycle. And when we say combined cycle, these are natural gas-fired power plants which have the capacity to ramp up and ramp down relatively quickly. And they can operate at a high level of efficiency uh, running natural gas. Now, hidden in this data, hidden in this data is a, a city, series of assumptions on fuel costs, right? Natural gas is relatively cheap in the United States. Everything would argue is going to remain cheap. We just, our reserves are so massive, okay. And, uh, and when you, when, you, when you compare dispatchable to non-dispatchable technology and you include, and actually, you know what, there's pretty good news in this for some of the renewable folks, and that is the transmission investment does not seem to be that high. But the transmission investment is relatively small. Why would it be compared, I was, Why would it be the transmission investment be different at all from transmission investment for fossil fuel generation? Well, in many cases for an existing infrastructure, um, if you have distributed energy, you're going to need more power lines. 
You're just going to need a different distribution network. I see. And that distribution network can be more expensive. That makes sense. And it's not, but I do think the uh, what's what's interesting is the O and M costs and the variable O and M costs, including fuel. You see the non-dispatchable technologies in order to meet the requirements of uh, being available of having this, you know availability through batteries or backup fuel, they must go ahead and spend money on, uh, you know, backup fuel. The other interesting thing is their, uh, their uh, operation and maintenance costs are quite high. And this is, so you often see, you, you often see these uh, bids in which people have a very low, when they're bidding, um, they're bidding variable costs. Um, solar, whatever, but they're, you're not seeing the full cost, either because the government's paying for it or it's subsidized directly or the capital cost was uh, taken care of in some other mechanism. And what you're talking so, about is uh, batteries, uh, other kinds of storage, and the electronics yeah, that so make, I, it, make it firm, yeah? Right, but I would say the battery stuff is not in here yet, okay? Really, I don't think EIA really thinks we... We have good data yet on batteries or that. It's, uh, we're at the point where we can cost them out in any reasonable way. So the chart, so this is even without... the chart that you were showing a minute ago um, with, yeah. with, uh, for the costs on uh, fossil fuel versus renewables, on the renewable side, it does not include the infrastructure, the, uh, the, the cost of putting the infrastructure in to make the renewables dispatchable? Or does it? So... No, it does. It does include this. For the non-dispatchable technologies, these, these, in order for them to be usable in an effective way, they have to have backup, and that's included in some of this. And you can see that in the, in the, uh, in the variable O&M costs, mm -hmm. which are actually not... Uh, can we uh, see that chart again? Let's take, let's take a look at that chart again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would say yes. The, the, that is not actually – those charts really just include uh, uh, the transmission investment, fixed O&M, and levelized capital. You're right. It's not – we don't have the backup fuel costs in these yet. Well, what I get out of this, taken together with the, the chart about California renewable, the, the, the cost of developing renewables in California is that – you have to spend a fair amount of money on developing renewables. We, we, only, we always knew that, but, uh, but then you also have to build that into a comparative pricing uh, analysis. And I'm not sure we've exactly. done that. No, I mean, I do think it's really hard for politicians to be uh, fully open with their community. And because they're trying to get something done and they can't say, well, you know, this is kind of risky. It might be expensive. It's much better to just say, look, this is better than sliced bread. You should go for this. I promise you it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nature of politics, isn't it? You know, politics is right. short-term so, planning. Energy has to be long-term planning. And the two yeah, do not I necessarily do think, mix. I do think it would be a lot better to just try to educate the public I mean, actually, people, you know, the citizenry, are, they're willing to take some risks, but they just don't want to be, <laughs> they don't want to be holding the bag all the time. It just doesn't work out. <laughs> so when, how does, what does that so, translate to, for Hawaii? I mean, how, how, how does that well, come down for us? Well, funny you should ask that. Let's go to our last chart. So well, if here, you look at the cost one. of... Okay, here, we do have it. Yes, here it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. So I think it's very, this is a very interesting chart because it shows uh, basically this chart argues that uh, LNG, you see they had uh, Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island. They showed LNG coming in at about uh, 20 cents, uh, you know, kilowatt hour. It's sort of a read best estimate. And they showed a huge variation in, um, in uh, fuel oil, right, the cost of fuel oil. Mm -hmm. But the the 24.7 cents a kilowatt hour for 2014, I did show the data on the right for June of every year from 2014 to 2018. 
And it's important to understand this number moves around. So that 24.7 cents for June of 2014 was a very high point in low sulfur fuel oil, right? Mm -hmm. Company, in Hawaii user. Basically, you're paying the same price, the same wholesale price, a non-tax price for diesel fuel. And But notice the price in 2017 and 2016, 2015. So the price came down. 2018, the average price is around 220, and I believe next year it's going to be less. So, yes, um, the thing you need to ask yourself here on this chart first, if you were to use the LNG, could you get a contract in which the stability of the price, you see, the point estimate appears to be higher than the distributed renewables, but the chart doesn't describe the risk around the renewables, except around the power sources, except in two areas. One is they've got one here with a battery technology of 19 to 24.8 cents. Those are numbers someone pulled out of a different part of their body. They have no idea what those true costs are going to be. And you have these LNG costs, which appear to be somewhat higher than the, than the low point in fuel oil, but higher than the high point. And it seems to me that the question that should be asked about all this is, um, is this really a chart we want to use to decide what we're going to do with uh, power in Hawaii? <laughs> or should we try to peel this back a bit and ask ourselves, okay, what kind of risk profile do we face in these different fuel choices, particularly if we're going to go with 100% renewable? And I think that that is a much more sophisticated and difficult question to present to the public, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, if we give up a portfolio approach, a portfolio which would include maybe some LNG, some, some fuel oil, some coal, and renewables, if we go to 100% renewables, are we subjecting ourselves to a higher risk of a price spike? Well, let me throw a factor at you on, on, the yeah. very, on that very point. You know, if, if, you, if you spend the money, uh, build the infrastructure, build the electronics, build all that storage, uh, and you have the renewables pumping out, you know, renewable fuel at a, at a pretty, at a pretty um, uh, consistent rate, consistent price, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you've achieved a certain level of consistency for planning purposes on the renewables, okay? Um, but if you keep on uh, if you keep on using global supplies, and I guess that would include not only uh, petroleum but also LNG, where where the, the cost is going to be determined by factors that are completely outside our control. Uh, who knows what the global market will bring? It's geopolitical. Um, uh, you know, anything could happen any day on either um, petroleum or LNG then that's, that's really a, a certain amount of risk. Right now, it's less than $50. But who knows what would happen in the Middle East, which is, we know, volatile, always volatile. Um, and for that matter, LNG, well, LNG is mostly from the U.S., I guess. But uh, if, if LNG were also subject to international risks, then we'd have a, a fair amount of risk uh, on the fossil fuel side, where we have a containable, predictable risk uh, on the uh, renewable side. Am I right? Well, I would disagree that you have a containable, predictable risk. You're dealing with new technologies. You cannot at all say that the bat you know what the battery costs are. You do not know. You do not know whether you're going to get an unusual failure rate. You have mechanisms, of course, to deal with this risk. You can have long-term contracts. You can have you can enter the futures market. There are lots of ways you can deal with price risk, even on world-traded commodities. And I, I guess my my advice would be, each one of these comes with a set of risks. And much like investing in the stock market, I would not put all my money into Apple. Okay, <laughs> I would have a diversified portfolio. And I think, but it depends, you know, if in fact um, the commitment to renewable power is a kind of religious imperative, okay, I get it. 
It's a religious imperative. But if, in fact, you are holding and you are acting like a public utility commission and you are worried about the – you have a certain oblique financial, fiduciary interest to your consuming public, well, I would suggest that someone should take a hard look at the risks of all those alternatives and ask themselves, maybe we need a diversified portfolio. Well, we've always, we've Which, always talked about that. And uh, as uh, <laughs> Mina Marita, the, the uh, previous uh, chair of the uh, commission, and, and I remember Josh Strickler gave a, gave a talk at which we were, we were uh, present, said you got to avoid having the caterpillar in the salad, <laughs> which means you can't have a surprise in there. And one surprise, yeah. by the way, to, to go to your point, one surprise is if we if we buy batteries, um, a lot of those batteries are going to be made offshore. And if we have trouble on tariffs, for example, or geopolitical factors that affect the, the price of manufacturing them and and buying them from countries like China, for example, which manufactures a lot of batteries these days and a lot of electronics that we can use to, you know, to to control costs. Um, we don't. And by we, the we, way, we that, don't know what's going to happen on that either, do we? Not only that, and that's before that's before you talk about the environmental consequences of producing all this lithium and all these batteries, and the recycling and disposable of these batteries. That should be part of the equation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just. I mean, I would say you know, so we're going 100 percent. If, if somebody came and said, "Look, we're going 100 percent with fuel oil," I said, "Well, I don't think that's a good idea." But if someone said we're going 100% with solar and wind, I'd say, well, that's probably not a good idea either. <laughs> I would say that you, you know, that some conservatism and caution should be the watchword as you proceed with the planning, because you also are going to lose opportunities to save a lot of money when the price of oil is low. Yes, you face a risk when the price of oil is high, but you're also losing the benefit of low oil prices, which is actually what has been happening since, if you look at this data, since about 2016. Yeah, very interesting, Lou. Lou Pugliarisi, Ebrink, joins us from Washington. We'll talk again soon. Aloha, Lou.